Hello, welcome everybody. My name is I'm a shoulder and elbow surgeon working at the University of Ghent in Belgium. I'd like to welcome all of you to the first user statistic webinar. Before we start, I would like to remind you that this course has received European accreditation and is also accredited for physiotherapists. To receive your accreditation, it is necessary to fill in the questionnaire at the end of the webinar. The webinar is subdivided into two sessions. The first session will mainly focus on diagnostics and non-operative treatment on patients with shoulder pain and curve tears. And the second session on the surgical treatment of post-operative rehabilitation. We encourage all of you to contact us through the tool you see on the right side of the screen. During the presentations, you can submit the question that you'd like to ask to one of the speakers during the next question and answer session. You can do this by clicking the click here to submit your question button. Besides, there is also the possibility to vote on the question that come in. You can do this by clicking on the triangle to the left of the question. This way, we can go through the most interesting and most popular questions during the Q&A round. After this introduction, I think it's now finally time to start our webinar. More than 80 years ago, Ernest Kotman described for the first time that the rupture of the rotator cuff might be a cause of shoulder pain and loss of function in his masterpiece, the shoulder rupture of the supraspinatus tendon and other lesions in and about the subacromial bursa. Since then, this pathology has been extensively investigated and as a result, several treatment protocols have been developed. Some people advocate non-operative treatment for as long as possible with physiotherapy and others propose as soon as possible surgical repair of a tear. As always, the truth will probably lie somewhere in the middle. During this webinar, physiotherapists from USER and surgeons from SESIC will provide updates on cutting edge therapeutics to treat shoulder with repairable rotating of tears. As a first speaker, I would like to introduce Paolo Paldini. Dr. Paldini is an Italian shoulder surgeon working in Cattolica. He's also chairman of the Educational Committee of SESIC. And today he will start his webinar with an overview of the anatomy of the rotator cuff and the patterns of rotator cuff ruptures. Good evening. It's a pleasure to start this uh, webinar speaking about anatomy and patterns of rotator cuff ruptures. You know that a uh, rotator cuff is uh, a complex of different tendon and muscles. They are, come, they are starting from anteriorly from subscapularis. We have a, a supraspinatus, infraspinatus and teres minor. You can see two different drawings. And you can see here that all uh, the muscle and the tendon cover all the humeral head from, and from posterior to anterior, in this case, teres minor, infraspinatus, supraspinatus and subscapularis. Subscapularis is the main uh, internal rotator that we have. It's uh, starting from the ventral blade of the scapula and it's finishing on the lesser tuberosity. And you can see here some different tests that we can use to evaluate this, this tendon. Uh, this uh, tendon, this is the, belly, the Gerber test, lift-off test, the belly press test and the BRI test. The supraspinatus is the, the most known tendon of the calf, is starting from the supraspinatus fossa and the finishing on the greater tuberosity. And this is the job test that uh, uh, seems to evaluate best this kind of tendon. The infraspinatus is the, one of the main external rotator that we have, is starting from the posterior blade of the scapula, finishing to the uh, greater tuberosity, the lateral side of the greater tuberosity. And this is an external rotator. The PAT test is uh, the best test that we can have to evaluate this tendon. Finally, the teres minor is the fourth one. It's starting from the inferior part and posterior part of the scapula. It's finishing even this side on the posterior part of the greater tuberosity. And there are two tests to evaluate the function of the, uh, uh, of the teres minor, that is, the, the last external rotation that, that rotator that we have. Regarding rotator cuff, we know that uh, we have uh, a cuff tear 
depending on the age of the patient, depending on the history of the trauma of the patient, depending on the arm, if it's dominant or not, and depending on the age. And we know that the age is, uh, the, 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 the rate of tendon tear is increasing with the age. Some biological profile can help us to have this kind of lesion if you have a smoker, if you use inside, if you have a general disease like uh, uh, diabetes, and if you are a very uh, hard worker in this case, the, the, prob the probability to have a, a big tear is uh, increasing with the age. What we have to evaluate uh, for a calf tear? We have to evaluate the extent of the tear, topography of the tear in sagittal and frontal plane, the trophism of the muscle of the torn tendon and the state of the longest of the biceps. Different classification was made to evaluate the, uh, the rotator cuff tear. And uh, this one is based on the bone, on the location, if on the bone, on the tendon, a muscular tendinous junction or on the muscle. And you can see here a case with a B, a B tear. And in this case, we have the tendon tear. The tear is located on the tendon. Different, uh, different um, classification is based on, the, on the, the shape of the tear. In this case, we can have a crescent tear, a triangular defect, or L-shaped defect, or massive tear. And different classification is made by Burke that the classification is just associated with, one, with, with the kind of repair that you can do in this case. Similar topography, according to Pate, is topography uh, including the, the anterior part, the superior part, and the posterior part of the calf. That is uh, really close to that one from Abermeyer, that where you can find zone A, zone B, and zone C progressing from anterior to posterior part of the calf. Different classification is made by Elman. It depends on the grade of lesion that you have. Is a partial tear grade one, partial tear grade two, three. Grade two and complete tear in grade three. This is this uh, classification is similar to that one made by Snyder. When you have uh, articular surface tears, uh, bursal surface tear, or complete tears that connecting articular side with bursal side, and you can see that even for a, a complete tear, you can have small, moderate, large, or massive. What are the classification of COVID? Classification of COVID is quite similar. You can see different tears based on the, uh, on the wideness of this tear. And this classification is similar to that one uh, made by Bateman, but Bateman uh, after the bridement, after the bridening, the vascular age of the tendon. But the classification is uh, quite similar. Different is the, uh, the topic about the subscapularis that I think we, can, we have to consider apart because it's different from the other tendon. In this case, uh, we know that uh, the subscapularis can, be, uh, can have a lesion in the partial lesion of the superior third, a complete lesion of the superior one third, the superior two thirds, or you can have the complete lesion of the tendon. You can see here the different classification. This is an arthroscopic classification. And the last case, you see, you can see that there is a, a subluxation of the humerus towards the coracoid edge. But first of all, we have to understand that we need to classify the tear. So we have to evaluate the pattern, the extension of the tear, the atrophy of the tear, the retraction, the location. After you've done this, you can even treat the tear in the, in, in the right way. But we have to classify not only the tear, even the quality of the muscle. And you can see that you can have acute or chronic lesion. You can have a, a classification even of the atrophy of the muscle. This one is made by Tomaso, depending on the atrophy of the tendon, of the muscle. And there is the tangent sign explained by Zanetti, where the tangent between the the posterior part of the scapula and the anterior part, you can have the, ten, the muscle inside or outside this tangent sign. The first classification uh, I would like to remember um, was made by Goutalier, where you can evaluate on a CT scan the presence of fat inside the muscle. This was the, 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 the topic regarding uh, the position of the ten, or the position of the tear. But I think that the most important is to understand where the association of 
the lesion of one tendon with another one can give you different uh, different uh, kind of uh, uh, dysfunction. In this case, uh, uh, Philippe Collin evaluated the different association between the lesion, between the lesion type A, this was from uh, subscapularis superior and the supraspinatus, type B, all the subscapularis and the supraspinatus, and so on. And you can see that the most important is the type B because it's the most prone to have a pseudo paralysis of the shoulder. So we don't have just to understand which is the, the which is the shape of the lesion, which is the trophies of the lesion, but even which kind of tendon are involved in this lesion to understand better and to have a prognosis about this kind of lesion. In conclusion, you need to do a right diagnosis using all the instruments that we have, imaging and uh, clinical test to do a correct treatment and to achieve a good outcome in this kind of patient. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Paolo, for this uh, nice overview. Now I would like to give the floor to Joe Gibson and Professor Leonard Funk. Mrs. Gibson, also known as the shoulder geek, is a clinical physiotherapy specialist at the Liverpool Upper Limit Upper Limp Unit based in the UK. And Professor Funk is working as a consultant in Wrightington. He's also the developer of the popular shoulder website, ShoulderDoc. I'm really looking forward to the presentation. How do I clinically investigate a patient with a suspected rotative tear? So Joe, I've got this patient. She's, um, she's in her thirties and she's just had a fall off her horse. Um, and I wonder whether she's got a rotator cuff tear I was wondering, as you know, as a physio, what are the things you would look for to determine whether this is a patient that's going to respond well to rehab, or you know, you might want to get investigation, a surgical opinion. Cool. Yeah. Well, look, I guess the first thing I want to know is in, in terms of the onset of the symptoms. So for me, my subjective history is all really in about eighty percent of my decision making. So. I'd want to know when she fell off the horse, did she have immediate onset of pain and loss of function? And has that persisted over a two to six week period? Because I think when we look at the studies, that kind of highlights a group that are more likely to go on to surgery. So that initial history is absolutely key. Mm -hmm. um, but I think then it's patient factors in terms of her age is obviously a positive thing in that she's young, um, her activity level and what she wants to get back to. Um, but then important things just about her lifestyle and her general health. So do you think those are the factors that you might think more towards getting a surgical opinion on as opposed to an older patient who's less active? Absolutely. Um, so I think I would have to caveat that with um, clearly we know from lots of studies that patient expectations are key. So I need to know that she's brought into physiotherapy yeah. and because that's a bigger predictor of outcome than a lot of the other things that we can measure and her beliefs about that injury and what she might have been told by somebody else. But there's absolutely no doubt that somebody who is young, um, who's healthy, um, who wants to get back to high level, I think they're a group that have a far lower threshold, particularly if they have weakness clinically. And I think that's, again, an important caveat is that if we look at decision-making, weakness is a far more useful indicator for surgery than pain, because pain is more highly correlated with pain catastrophizing, emotional well-being, um, level of education, things that really have very little to do with the structure of that tear, um, whereas weakness seems to be a much better indicator. But again, for me, it's can I differentiate between um, pain inhibition or true weakness? And I have to be honest, but I think there are things that help me weigh up that clinical decision making. But I think you're absolutely right, first and foremost, that history, that age, and what that patient wants to get back to. So clinically, there are some things that you can do to help you decide whether the patient will respond well to rehab. Uh, so can we have a look at those? Absolutely, yeah. So in terms of the things I find really useful from a clinical perspective, of course, I'll use, do my usual observation, look for any evidence of atrophy. But as I said before, one of the key indicators is if this weakness that I can't change. So we know that, for example, things like our full CANS test is probably one of the most reliable of our special tests. But we also recognise the limitation of those tests in really identifying whether I do have a cuff tear or not. And in reality, if I resist here and Ellie's painful, 
and weak. How do I know that's a cuff tear or just pain inhibition? Similarly, if I did external rotation in neutral, which again is a kind of preferable position for, for infraspinatus, again, there's lots of other muscles working. And again, I don't know if it's pain inhibition. So in terms of giving me the best chance of seeing if that cuff has the potential to compensate, I guess, then my approach is just to unload that arm, take limb load away. I get Ellie to just make a fist because that gives us some kind of local recruitment. But then I just do those tests again. So she can now externally rotate into my arm. That's great. Or she can abduct into my hand. And really what I'm looking for, is she significantly more strong? Yes, no. Now, of course, even if she is and has less pain, I still can't say she hasn't got a tear. But the fact I can change it in such a positive way to me is a good indication that she's got potential to rehab. Now, I can look at that in more detail by looking at her in prone. So again, look, if I was not getting any positive effect from doing this test in standing. So if I get Ellie to just lie down on the plinth. Now, I'd obviously look at her unaffected arm first, but let's assume this is her affected arm. Um, Karen Jin's lovely research um, looks at the fact that with the arm in this position, I've got my deltoid and my lat stabilizing the arm. So again, this isn't just looking at the cuff. And I, ask, I look at the patient's passive range of movement and then ask them, can they support the weight of the arm and actively rotate through that passive range? Now, somebody who's had an acute injury and got a cuff tear, there's no way they're going to be able to support the weight of the arm. It will be too painful. So then what I would do is support it on some towels, get the patient to relax completely. Again, just make a fist just to get that initial kind of switch on and then repeat the test again. And often you'll find that patients can then do this well. So it's a similar way of just unloading the system. So we make it more specific to the cuff and see, can it cope? Yes, no. Now I can do exactly the same in terms of subscap. And I have to say, I find this a really nice way of just making it as easy as possible, taking away limb load and seeing, can the cuff compensate? Yes, no. Again, it's really important to be honest. We can't differentiate. That doesn't rule out a tear. But to me, it's a good indicator that it's worth trying to rehab this patient. In terms of where I'd start, I'd obviously ask the patient to show me the movement that they were having the most issue with. So we get Ellie, so let's say it's elevation. And then I want to use symptom modification procedures to see if I can change that. Now, in terms of a rationale for symptom modification, we're really looking at unloading the system to make it easier for the cuff to do its job. And then just giving resistance or changing the scapula purely to see can we influence pain and how easy it is for the patient to do that. Preferentially recruits the posterior cuff and then just get her to follow me up to the ceiling. Does that improve her pain? Yes, no. If that still doesn't change it or isn't really improving her ability to lift the arm, the last thing I can do again with that short lever arm is a scapular assistance test where I literally just push the scapula into upward rotation and protraction through range. But essentially what I'm looking for is do I change her ability to do that movement and reduce her pain? Because that's useful in informing how likely she is to respond to rehabilitation. So I've done my clinical examination and despite unloading the arm, putting this patient in different positions, I've not been able to change that weakness or ability of the cuff to do its job. And I've not been able to influence that pain and weakness. So with that history in this age group of patients, what are my next options? Well, in that situation, I would actually have a low threshold to get an ultrasound scan and potentially an early surgical opinion. So Joe kindly sent me this patient to see whether she benefit from a surgery and find out whether there's a true cuff tear there. I think the two things I want to know as a surgeon, really, is this kind of patient going to need surgery? Um, and what type of surgery? So in terms of the decisions for surgery, I think Joe very clearly said age, functional demands, um, <clears throat> and uh, pain and current function are the key things I'm looking for. So in a younger patient, more active patient, higher functional demands with a traumatic injury, we're gonna be thinking more likely gonna need surgery. In terms of the, the pain, and the strength, I like to use the modification tests and also then look at the degree of strength. So we'll run through that in detail today. So Ellie, we'll just get Ellie to turn and face the mirror. So I like to see the patient facing the mirror. 
And the active range of movement is very helpful in going into flexion and then going down and then going into abduction because it tells us in terms of how much stiffness and how much limited movement they have. So what we can tell is from the passive movements, okay, she's got full passive movement and she had full active movement. It tells us that there's no stiffness we need to deal with as well. So if her active movement's limited um, and the passive movement's full, we know that's predominantly going to be a weakness issue. Also looking at the scapular humeral rhythm gives us an idea of where any restrictions are, if they go in a humeral or if they scapular. What's important is if she does get pain in an active range of movement, and the same with passive, is to correct her scapula, so if you get your shoulders right back and chest out, and then go again. And if that's less painful, it doesn't matter whether she's got a tear or not, that tells us she should respond well to uh, rehab. And again, with passive tests, if she gets pain and abduction passively, but when we correct her scapula and we then do it and it's painless, I would tend to think less likely surgery and more likely respond well to rehab. So the next step is looking at the strength. So if you can turn around for us. So in terms of the strength, quickly a quick examination is assessing the superior cuff in the scapular pain. I like to do it both sides and is there any weakness on long lever arm testing? In a younger, stronger patient, long lever arm. In an older patient, shorter lever arm. If she's got weakness there on long lever arm, I'll test short lever arm. And I also like to do them at, at about 30 degrees as well. So in both positions, it always just adds that little bit extra. In terms of <clears throat> and the lag drop arm sign is telling you the extensiveness of that weakness. Doesn't always correlate with the anatomical size of this tear. In external rotation to the extreme, and again both sides, and if there is some weakness on this side, then it will then test for a lag sign, and it tells us the degree of posterior cuff. So, therefore, there's probably more posterior cuff involvement. Then going into abduction, if they can't hold it there, then they might drop, which is a one horn blowers, or you ask them to come from here to this position up here. And if they can do that, there's less posterior inferior cuff involvement. And if they can't do that, then there probably is posterior inferior cuff involvement, which correlates with a part probable irreparable rotator cuff tear. <clears throat> In terms of subscap, I just do two, the bear, belly press and the bear hug. And the belly press is helpful because if they go forward and you push back, good strength, but sometimes they can't even get forward. And then if they can passively, okay, just keeping an eye on the scapula, if they can passively get there, that tells me there's a lag and more extensive, whereas possibly if they can't, that's probably stiffness. And then in terms of the weakness of the subscap, I find the bear hug test very helpful and I like to do it in different positions. And you see how this hand is stopping them flexing, but so they just resist on internal rotation. And I do it in the high position and down in the low position. So in summary, in terms of whether they need surgery, I'm going to have surgery, that's the patient factors and the uh, expectation factors which Joe mentioned at the beginning. In the extensiveness of cuff involvement and stiffness versus weakness, that's where the clinical examination tests come in. And I think the next step, which should be part of most people's extension of their examination, is then to do an ultrasound scan so we can then correlate the anatomical size of the tear with the functional tear because they don't always correlate.
Thank you. Okay, go. Hang on. Sorry, I laughed. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Not to look happy, but I'm Joelena, thanks for this uh, great instructional video. I really have, uh, liked it. So as discussed by Leonard, after the clinical examination, the technical investigations are necessary to have a better understanding of the tear, the quality of the tendon and the atrophy of the muscle. And Professor Prismias Lubiatowski is working as a shoulder surgeon in Poznan. He's also the chairman of the CESIC and user Congress that was planned in Poznan this year, but was unfortunately canceled but we're all already looking forward to go to Poland next year. In this webinar, he will discuss what aspects of the tears he is looking for as a surgeon in the different technical investigations. You're all, thank you for inviting me for this wonderful symposium. I'll be speaking about the imaging for the rotator cuff tear from the surgical perspective. We know very well that the symptoms of our patients may not reflect the cuff status. We may have a patient having cuff tear impingement or bursitis and presenting with exactly the same clinical picture. So what kind of pathologies we can detect from the imaging? First of all, it's the tendinosis that may show up as a thickening or disruption of the fibers that may be accompanied by the inflamed bursa or uh, impinging acromial osteophytes, as you can see on this picture. Partial cuff tears may occur from the articular site or from the bursa site. They may be located in different areas, for example, pasta lesion affecting junction of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons. We would like to know how deeply tear penetrates the tendon or whether just the part of the tendon is affected or maybe entire tendon. Full thickness tears, they have several parameters that we would like to know about just from the imaging. First of all is the size and location. We'd like to know whether the part of the tendon or entire tendon is detached whether just the one tendon is uh, torn, or maybe it's a massive tendon tear affecting at least two tendons. We'd like to know whether there are any signs of the degeneration of the tendon, like decreased length, delamination, or the, th or, or the thinning. Those are important factors that may indicate that the tear may be difficult to repair, that may progress, or it may be less likely to heal after repair. But also we are looking at other parts of the cuff, like the muscle. We'd like to know whether there is any sign of atrophy, retraction of fatty infiltration, or another sign of um, chronicity like humeral heads, uh, superior migration. Imaging may also help us differentiate between the acute and chronic tendon tears. And those are all important predictors of repairability of the tendon that may affect our choice of the treatment or the technique if we choose to operate. What kind of modalities we have available for our patient? First of all, it's a radiography. It's inexpensive, easily accessible. It has a good value for the cuff detection, but only if we have a narrowing of the subacromial space and remodeling of our chromium and tuberosity. It may also serve to exclude other reasons for the pain, like osteoarthritis. It may have some value for the trauma. However, if it's poor, if it's normal, it has a poor value for detection of the cuff tears. So we need another modalities like ultrasonography. It has a lot of advantages like high resolution, easy access, low cost, no radiation. It may be dynamic. It may uh, allow us for uh, evaluation of control at our shoulder and perform some procedures. However, it's limited for the labrum uh, anteriorly and superiorly, and also it's operator, operator dependent. The way we use it in our clinic is that either I use it for my patients in office using simple device uh, that I just do it as an extension of my clinical examination and do it just after I finish clinical judgment. Or we may use a specialized, uh, specialized ultrasound scan uh, done by the musculoskeletal radiologist with very high resolution uh, machine and also providing us with the detailed report. Resonance. It's very popular. It has a lot of advantages of the high resolution board for the cuff, but also for the labrum and the bone. It's graphic, it has no radiation as well. And on top of it, arthrography may be very highly accurate for the partial tears and the labrum. Again, it has some limitations. It's more expensive, takes longer to acquire. Not every patient can have it, like patients having some metals, pacemakers, 
being very large or claustrophobic may not have it done. Uh, it also depends on the quality of the resonance and the technologist. There have been several studies comparing the value of the ultrasound scan MRI and the Arthur MRI um, for detection of the cutters, and that has been shown that either technique is very good for the full detection of full cutters, and the partial tears may be better detected by the Arthur MRI. How we do it in our clinic, if we have a shoulder pain uh, patient with impaired function and we evaluate it, we would like to see if there is any likelihood of significant tear with traumatic loss of active range of movement. If there is no such thing, then we would send our patient for the X-ray and I would do this ultrasound scan myself. If there is no suspicion of the cuff tear, no suspicion of the labor pathology, then the patient goes for an appropriate treatment. If it fails, or the patient has probability of other pathologies, then I would go for the Arthur MRI or alter alternatively ultrasound scan specialized or MRI. If, however, I see that there is a full thickness tear on my ultrasound scan that I do it myself and I consider the patient for the surgery, then I would go for the evaluation with the specialized ultrasound scan or MRI. If at the very beginning patient has a strong likelihood of a significant tear, and I consider that the patient may need the surgery, then I send the patient for the MRI. If cannot, if that cannot be done, then I use the X-ray plus a specialized ultrasound scan. Other scenarios for which we use the imaging is the post-operative scenario. We would like to monitor our healing of the tendon and also see detect the reasons for the complications if they occur. So every patient in my office is scanned by myself at the follow-up. And I use the specialized ultrasound scan for those patients having chronic pain or delayed recovery. Alternatively, other modalities can be used. For the athletes with a high level, I would see with a suspected cuff tear, then I use the specialized ultrasound scan and an ultra MRI. So to conclude, we need imaging that should be determined by the history and examination by a clinician. And the major aim of the imaging is to identify the cuff lesions that correspond to the symptoms and the function assist in selecting treatments, identify the risk of failure if we choose to operate, evaluate the healing of the repair, and perform some ultrasound-guided procedures. And I strongly invite you uh, to Poland next year in September for the SATSEC SM meeting, and specifically for this joint symposium of the user on our traumatic shoulder instability. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Preslo. The question now arises, which tear should be treated conservatively and which one surgically? And I'd like to give the floor to Professor Lars Adolfsson from the University of Limkopen in Sweden. A few months ago, he published a prospective study on the treatment of small acute traumatic cuff tears. And I think he's the perfect person to discuss which parameters can be used to determine an operative or a non-operative treatment of rotator cuff tears. Hello, I'm Lars Hardofsson. I'm going to talk to you about the selection of treatment for our rotator cuff patients. The issue is quite difficult because not all rotator cuff defects are symptomatic. On the other hand, not all symptoms can be ascribed to rotator cuff defects. So if we read how I'm going to try to interpret what is written about this problem. I checked out the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons homepage because I thought they you ought to know. And I picked out some quotes. For instance, they say, if you have a rotator cuff rupture and keep using your arm, you're going to get worse. They also maintain that uh, non-surgical treatment would lead to an increased tear size and your activities need, may be limited. While on the other hand, if you get operated, you usually do well. So my only interpretation of this is that they strongly advocate surgery for rotator cuff, cuff uh, tear. I wish it would be that simple because if you look at the literature, you're going to find that there's no real evidence for either kind of treatment. So basically, we don't really know what to do. Yet, we also know that some people do benefit from surgery. And our job is to find out who. My structured way of trying to look at this is um, check the patient, duration of the symptoms, localization and size of rupture, the state of the rest of the rotator cuff muscles, 
and if at all is possible to repair a cough defect. The patient's biological age or any condition affecting microcirculation will tell me something about the um, ability of the cough re uh, defect to heal after a, a repair. We also want to look at level of activity because same gender and same age doesn't necessarily seem uh, to mean the same demands. And we use a, an activity scale that we have designed for upper extremity. This is also presented in a poster during this meeting. And we found that um, quite a few people assess themselves very differently, even though they seemingly have the same condition, the same age and same gender. I also want to know if it's a fresh or an old rupture because that tells me something about healing potential. I want to know about localization of the rupture because if it engages the infraspinatus and subscapularis a little bit, apart from only the sub, uh, supraspinatus, we are me more keen to repair it. And particularly because that is, a, if it's anterior or posterior directed, it also tends to enlarge a little bit more than if it's just inside the supraspinatus cable region. Because we really want to maintain the balanced uh, force couple of the infraspinatus and subscapularis. That means that we're more concerned about localization of the rupture than size. We also want to know if the rest of the rotator cuff muscles are intact or active, or if they're um, affected by uh, fatty infiltration and uh, atrophy. And finally, we want to know if it's it at all possible to repair the effect. And sometimes that's only to be decided during surgery. There are also factors related to the cuff tear itself, and I've categorized those into five different types. First of all, a fresh rupture with a previously healthy shoulder, or healthy patient, we're very keen to repair that within the first three to four months. And usually in our case is that through a mini open repair. The second group is those having had symptoms and then have an enlargement of the tear following in a new trauma, sometimes called acute and chronic. And if it's a small rupture, we tend to save it for um, non-operative treatment at first. But if it's enlargement involving an infraspinatus or subscapularis, we're more active with uh, surgery. Long-standing symptoms are always six months of non-operative treatment to start with. Then if pain is still a problem, gliding surface restorement is usually most important. Irreparable tears without osteoarthritis, which also tend to um, treat with non-operative treatment at least six months. And then if we need to do some kind of reconstruction, that's usually soft tissue repair with augmentation, sometimes with patches, sometimes with bicep tendon, and sometimes with the tendon transfer, typically the latissimus torsi. An irreparable tear with osteoarthritis is usually treated with a prosthesis of some kind. Today, most often a reverse type prosthesis, but there are also other kinds that are still uh, feasible. Biased by my own experience, local tradition, and a um, few other things, I would like to summarize this into the patients that are most likely to benefit from non-operative treatment and those with relatively short duration, a small tear, and a reasonable a constant MERLE score to start with. And they also usually respond well to subacromial local anesthesia and uh, a steroid injection. While those least suitable for surgical treatment and are with more insidious onset, typically um, neck pain, radiating pain down the arm, sometimes psychological issues and work-related problems, and those I try to keep out of surgery. And finally, those most suitable for surgical treatment are obviously those with a fresh rupture in a previously healthy shoulder, which is sometimes called acute, the rest of the rotator cuff more or less intact, a uh, active patient with a high um, 
uh, activity normally and a high motivation to come back to the previous um, level of activity. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you, Lars. The next very important question is, if you start treating patients non-operatively, what physiotherapeutic options are there to make them pain-free again and get them functionally better? For this interesting topic, I would like to give the floor to Professor Anne Kohls. Professor Kohls works at the University of Ghent and the University of Copenhagen. Dear Anne, I'm looking forward to your view on this question. Welcome to this presentation on exercise therapy for patients with rotator cuff tears with the specific question, how do we choose the appropriate exercises? When we design an exercise program, we have to take into account several variables. Some of these variables are more exercise related, such as the goal of the exercise, but some others are more related to the patient, such as the age, the activity level, or the psychosocial factors. With respect to the exercise-related factors, specifically for this population, it is generally accepted that we should train the function and not too much the structure. So we should not focus too much on training the rotator cuff, but rather focus on training the elevation function of the patients, because that is what they want to do in daily life. And in order to compensate for the deficient cuff, it is often such suggested that we, we should train the deltoid instead of the rotator cuff. Now, when we look into the literature, into studies combining elevation exercises, deltoid training with minimal rotator cuff load, we find some EMG studies on one hand and some clinical studies looking at the effectiveness of a, a specific exercise program on the other hand. Now, how can we unload the rotator cuff? We can do that by performing low load closed chain exercises, such as the band slide on the left side of this picture or the wall slide on the right side. Now, how can we progress these exercises? We can do that by increasing the elevation angle of the shoulder. And in the bench slide, we do that by increasing body movements. We can add some gravity in the wall slide versus no gravity in the bench slide. And of course, we can add some external resistance in this case with a, an elastic band. A second group of exercises which we can use are the so-called open chain exercises with compression forces. Here, the patient is performing an open chain exercise with the hand freely moving in space. However, the gravity or the external resistance provides a nice, comfortable comp compression force into the joint. Now, for the purpose of this presentation, I will further call this the Levy exercises to the author of the paper who published this exercise program for the first time. How can we progress these exercises? We can start passively and then progress into active exercises. We can add some external resistance, in this case with a uh, weight ball, and we can increase the inclination of the shoulder again by increasing the body position. Now, the main question is, do we really do what we want to do? Do we train the deltoid without too much load on the rotator cuff? In order to answer that question, we performed an EMG study looking at EMG activity in the deltoid on one hand, in the rotator cuff on the other hand, and in the scapular muscles. So what we mainly found in a progression between the bilateral bench slides with two hands below 90 degrees on your left side and the unilateral wall slide against resistance on your right side, we saw an increase of activity in the anterior deltoids. We also saw an increase in activity in all four major scapular muscles. In the meantime, we saw that for the infraspinatus that was the representative of the rotator cuff in this study, we never exceeded activity above 15%. So it means that indeed you can train the deltoid and the scapular muscles during elevation exercises without too much load on the rotator cuff. Also during the Levy exercises, we saw that the anterior deltoid was more activated when we increased the progression from a passive version on the left side to an inclined active version with an external resistance on the right side. But the main result was 
that the highest activity increase was found when we inclined the patient a bit more. So it's much more important to increase your inclination than increasing your external resistance. Regarding the patient-related factors, I would like to talk you, to you about briefly about the level of irritability um, determining the uh, choice of exercises. Now, an interesting paper was published in 2015, which is called the STAR shoulder, the staged approach for rehabilitation classification. There, the author starts with the clinical entity of a shoulder symptoms, which we always screen at the for the first time to see whether a patient is appropriate for physical therapy or not. Then we try to find what the underlying diagnosis could be. And in general, in this paper, they divide it into four categories the painful shoulder, the stiff shoulder, the unstable shoulder, and then other problems around the shoulder. But then, as you can see, regardless of the diagnostic pathology, they come back to a third level of examination in which they try to find out what is the level of irritability. Now, a high irritability symptoms are characterized by high levels of pain, more than seven out of 10, consistent pain uh, during rest, but also during the night, and high disability. And the main purpose here is that we should minimize physical stress. When patients have low irritability problems, they have low levels of pain, no pain during the night or in rest, and there they also have lower levels of disability. And there the major intervention focus is to increase the physical stress on the tissue uh, with respect to increasing the capacity or the uh, loadability. Now we applied this principle on a 12-week tailored home-based home rehabilitation program for patients with degenerative rotator cuff tears. So we looked at the level of irritability, the range of motion and the strength deficits, and we applied the bench, the wall slides and the levy exercises to this population. We tested them at baseline after six weeks and after 12 weeks of treatment. To illustrate the, uh, the, the way in which we tailored the program, you see here a picture with on the X axis, the 12 weeks and on the Y axis, the 19 progressions we provided for the bench and the wall slides. So each patient is a separate line and it illustrates how tailored the program was. So not one patient performed the same program. They were all tailored based on their uh, requirements and their limitations. We used mainly two outcome measures in this study and one of them is the GROC or the Global Rate of Change. This is a measure in which you have an 11 point scale where you ask the patient whether they were changed compared to the previous session or not. In which minus five means they are much worse and plus five they are, it means they are completely recovered. As you can see here for the 19 patients that finally finished the study, we had an increase in the shock that was for most of the times and most of the patients higher than the minimal clinically important difference, which is the orange line. So most of our patients uh, reported a better, a, a global rate of change that was higher than what is su supposed to be clinically relevant. Secondly, we asked them the past or the patient acceptable symptom state, which is a simple yes or no question. Are you happy with the actual symptom state or not? As you can see at baseline, the majority of patients were not happy, but after 12 weeks, uh, most of the patients had an, a green light, which means that they have an acceptable symptom state at that time. So are there any other contextual factors that we need to take into account? Well, according to literature, yes, we do. To start with, the self-management seems to be very important, self-management and self-efficacy. Of course, as we could expect, adherence to the program is a very important variable. And because of that, it's important to keep it simple. So very often we say in the practice, try to do your exercises, three sets of 10 repetitions, as many times a day. But there is one more contextual factor that I want to bring under your attention, which is based on a study that was performed in the US, which is the, the Moon Shoulder Group study. And they uh, applied to an exercise program to more than 400 patients with degenerative rotator cuff tears. 
and 75% of them were happy and they did not go to surgery. However, 25% were not happy and went to surgery. So the question was, what is the big predictor for a negative outcome of um, the, the non-operative treatment? And it seems that the patient's expectations, expectations were the major predictor of negative outcome of exercise therapy. So what do we do with that in the practice? Well, I think it's very important that we should uh, create some positive, realistic expectations from our patients. So very often they go to Dr. Google, where they see images of tears and painful patients, and we should advise them not to look too much at the structure, but to think about the, the function more and to be positive about our exercise program. So to finalize this presentation, I would like to summarize some uh, issues in this DSTIC home messages for the clinician. To start with, when you do exercises with your rotator cuff tear patients, choose exercises with low load on the rotator cuff, the bench slides, the wall slides, and the Levy program. Provide them an individually based program based on, amongst other, the actual irritability of the problem. Create positive but also realistic expectation and reassure your patients that the degenerative rotator cuff tear as such is not alarming but is just part of a normal aging process. So I would like to thank the members of the Ghent Upper Limb Research Team for giving me the opportunity to present, to present their work. I would also like to thank in particular the students who helped me providing the data for the studies that I presented in this presentation. And last but not least, the orthopedic surgeons, Alexandre van Tongel, uh, University Hospital of Ghent and Overlevy, the Reading Shoulder Unit for their collaboration with me. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Anne. In the meantime, I've seen that several questions have already come in. And I would like to welcome the moderators, Susan Gart and Mehmet Dimmerham. Ms. Gart is working as a physiotherapist in the University Hospital in Geneva, Switzerland, and is the past president of USER. And Professor Dimmerham is working as a shoulder surgeon in Istanbul, in Turkey, and is also the past president of SESEC. And they will both moderate the Q&A session. Good luck. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have uh, so many questions and uh, Susan, uh, would you like to start with these questions? I uh, saw yes. so, so many questions and uh, <laughs> we have uh, just a limited time. Please, Susan, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so the, the, the star of um, the questions is uh, this one. I will read it to you. Some recent research states that we should get away from specific tests for rotator cuff. Do you suggest we should still use them to identify a structure or would it be better to use them as simple pain provocation tool? Yeah, maybe this address to uh, uh, the, uh, on the Leonard Frank and uh, Joe Gibson. Uh, I'll let you go on to that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Leonard. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so I, they're actually, interestingly, I was listening to a great um, uh, session on the JSPT podcast today from Jeremy Lewis, who did the ed editorial about putting special tests out to pasture. Mm. And I think it's really important to be clear that that editorial and a lot of the work about um, disregarding special tests is very much in a non-traumatic population. So I think we've all acknowledged tonight the importance of the patient history and the many different factors that we need to consider in terms of informing investigation and surgical intervention. But I think we also need to be careful in completely disregarding our tests. I think we do the best we can as clinicians to adjust, to adjust them. Um, and there's no doubt they're a very smaller part of our assessment. But to not use them in somebody with trauma, I think it, I would be uncomfortable because I think it is a useful part of informing my clinical decision making. I think in somebody without a, a, a history of trauma and particularly in a more degenerative population, we can really question their utility. But again, as a 
several of us have said that weakness is a far more useful indicator for some of these things than pain. And so how can we pick these things up if we don't assess them? We have to be honest about the limitations of our assessment, but combined with age, mechanism, location, all those patient factors we've discussed, I think there's still a role for them, particularly in a patient group with a history of trauma. Thank you. Susan, go ahead. Yes. I will have another question. The second one is, what is the function of the rotator cuff cable? So maybe for Paolo? The or... yeah. cable is a reinforcement that is between, uh, the, that is just behind the insertion of the supraspinatus and is, uh, the, it's just uh, when, you, when you look to a, to a boat, it's, it's just like the, 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 the age of the, it's just like the age of the boat. So you, you have to consider this, the, this the, 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 the loading part of the tendon. And it's more important because if you have a, a lesion of the cable, you have a complete disruption of the, of the cuff on that part. So it's, if you have a lesion that is uh, first than the, the, the cable, you can have still a functional cuff. If you have a lesion that go through the cable, you have a lesion that can impair the complete movement of the cuff. Uh, can you see the cable uh, clearly on uh, on any uh, investigation, like in MRI or ultrasound, or is this just in the clinical findings? I, I think it's just an arthroscopic view of the cable that you yes, can see. This from is, this is very important. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, maybe it's, uh, we are not sure about it uh, on the MRI or, or yes. ultrasound or whatever. Thank you, Susan. Yes, I have a question, I think for Anne. So as much as we should train the function and not the structure, at what moment should we decide to switch from deltoid training activities to rotator cuff loading again? Okay, I think this is a very relevant question from the clinic and it also highlights a little bit the gap in the literature that we have at this moment. In the traditional training, we were advised to focus more on the remaining rotator cuff to make these parts strong, to compensate for the deficient part of the cuff. And now there is more and more a tendency to say, let's skip the cuff training and let's go to the more functional movements in elevation. I think the, the major um, uh, decision here is based on some factors that are related to the patient. What is the age of the patient and what are, what, what are the goals of the patient? If you have an 80 year old person that only wants to elevate above shoulder height to be able to comb her hair, then we should not focus too much on the cuff and we should never move from the functional training towards the more cuff related training. However, if you have a patient that is more in the gray zone, 65 years old, uh, plays tennis once a week because after uh, retirement now they finally have time to play tennis, then we also should focus more on uh, exercises that train probably the rotator cuff a bit more. But I think it would be wrong to focus too much on isolated cuff training, but we should implement some functional diagonal trainings in view of return to activity. So I really believe that the, the approach here depends on the individual goals and the possibilities of the patients. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is actually a very important point, what you mentioned. Uh, Susan, we have a bunch of other questions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what is the role uh, for injections of anesthetics in the shoulder in the diagnosis for the difference between traumatic and degenerative uh, tears? Uh, this is uh, actually it's, uh, uh, maybe uh, go on, on the same way. Uh, maybe we can ask this question to Shemo. Shemo, what do you think? I occasionally use the injections as just the local anesthetic injection. Sometimes I use them together with the steroid, for example, for the patients that would not have a cuff there so much. But yes, I do that. And it actually helps you quite a lot in differentiating uh, the pain where it actually comes from, whether it comes from the around of the um, subcoracoid area, subacromial area, biceps tendon, or AC joint. So in the if the clinical judgment is not very specific in terms of local, local tenderness, then those injections might help you indicate where, where's the source of the pain. 
maybe in this point we can ask you the what does the specialized us tell us more than the uh, ultrasounds you do so yourself? yeah so so in our clinic what we have is we left the specialized ultrasound scanning for the radiologists so they usually that's something more similar to the of the quality of mri as opposed to the um, um, ultrasound scan that I do in my office, that usually is just a short extension of my examination and it takes, I would say, no time. It's like, you know, one minute. So I put this, this uh, the probe and just see if there's a cuff, yes or no, mostly see the inflammation and fluid collection, something like that. But if, we are, if I would like to have a more details, like full report on, you know, the status of the muscle, atrophy, degeneration, retraction, size, and, you know, signs of acute stirs, and things like that, that usually takes much longer to acquire, and it's like 15 minutes, maybe. So that's the difference. Yeah. Thank you. Susan? Yes, uh, one question about the role of the supraspinatus. Uh, Is it uh, involved in abduction, and uh, how, how does it work? Uh, as this question is, uh, probably goes to uh, more or less uh, in uh, in Ann. Uh, 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 do you want to? <laughs> so... Okay, you mean okay? I will uh, try to answer the question, but of course, I'm not a specialist in anatomy and in in the direction in which muscles are supposed to work. So we'll, I will reply in, uh, from my gut feeling and from my clinical experience. I think that the fact, the, the suggestion that the supraspinatus is working during abduction is a little bit old fashioned because this comes from the eighties where they said the supraspinatus initiates the abduction and then the delta it takes over. When we look at more recent EMG studies, it is very obvious that the supraspinatus is active much more during movements in which some kind of external rotation is involved compared to abduction. So if, as a clinician, if I want to train the supraspinatus, but this is not the topic of the seminar because now I want to avoid loading uh, the supraspinatus, but in a patient population where when you want to strengthen them, I mainly implement external rotation components in the exercises based on EMG studies showing that during external rotation, there is uh, the activity in the supraspinatus is equally high as in the infraspinatus. But if, once again, I would not do that primary in a rotator cuff tear patient. Yeah, uh, this is actually, uh, you are right. But maybe I need to ask because of this very hot topic uh, to Paula and to Le Leonard. Now is the new uh, champagne toss test is is actually more likely for supraspinatus than uh, the job test it's uh, uh, do you use paolo and lena to this uh, champagne toast test no i don't use this i just use uh, um, i use more the lag sign when you put the arm in a in the middle abduction and external rotation and i ask the patient to maintain this position i think that this lag sign uh, well described even uh, by our president, Italian president of society, of Italian shoulder and elbow society, Filippo Castoldi, is a well test, a well, well good test, and it's really important because even small degrees of lag sign are important to diagnose a, a, a supraspinatus stare. Leonard? Um, Leonard? I, I think it's not the specific name of a test. A lot of these tests are very similar. What are you trying to achieve um, with your assessment? I think as Joe said, so it's part of an assessment and we'll all have the tests that we like and that we favor and that gives meaning to us. And I think we know a combination of tests. So, you know, the question is, what are you assessing? Why are you assessing it? And then you use the assessment tools or the tests that work for you and that you do by trying different tests. So yes, it's a fine test, uh, but it's not that different to many others. It's a variation. I think the shoulder joint is the most popular joint for every test is uh, how many tests that we have is, I don't know. Uh, Susan, yes, another I question. Have a, yeah, I have a question for Lars. 
are the how do you know if the traumatic tears are really traumatic or are they just degenerative tears that uh, uh, are getting worse after a small incident? Well, the short and probably most honest answer is that I don't know. I, um, <laughs> but um, usually, I mean, as you all know, cough tears, they don't occur until we're like 40, 45 years old. So there's got to be some kind of degenerative element to it. So they are weakened before they sort of rupture, probably. But then again, having said that, you see sometimes patients with a true trauma. And I think the location of the rupture sometimes tells you, for instance, if you have the upper, the, the anterior superior quadrant, a little bit of the anterior supraspinatus, a little bit of the upper uh, subscap, those are truly traumatic tears, I guess, in 95%. Um, there are also uh, partial tears in 25-year-olds, uh, like volleyball players and athletes, something like that. And these are probably also truly traumatic. But the, the majority of the tears, they are occurring in an already weakened tendon by some kind of gen degeneration, I would say. Uh, it's maybe a, it's no. more of a duration rather than actually deciding on a, if it's, you know, it's, it's not about histology. <laughs> yeah. Maybe in this point, uh, there is a question, Susan, if you don't mind. No. Is it necessary to do any ultrasound after rotator cuff repair? Does it change the therapy if uh, there is a re-rupture? I it guess it's for me, right? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, for you, and uh, maybe it's also for Lars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, well, usually I, since the ultrasound scan is my off is in my office, so I scan every patient when I see after operation, and that's um, in the majority of the patients that the, the cup is well healed, and that's another th information that it gives to the patient. It's the reassurance that they are fine. And it's also some sort of psychological, you know, support for the patient that they cuff is doing great and, and they can, you know, proceed uh, with the, um, with, with, uh, with the exercises and, 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 uh, and therapy. And it has a meaning, it has a meaning for the patients that have the continuous pain despite the surgery and despite the rehab. And for those patients, sometimes it's, it's, it's good to know what, what's happening, whether there's any kind of impingement. So yes, I do it, uh, but I do it myself and it costs nothing. And it's just a part of my examination. Yes, do you wanna add something in this point? If you do surgery and you, do, you can consider if the patients uh, don't have any compliance and uh, do you do an ultrasound for control after the, uh, ultra, uh, after the surgery? Usually, usually we, 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 we have ultrasound in, uh, in our office. So if necessary, we use, uh, but uh, we, we use this uh, just for the patient. If the patient asks uh, to, to look at the, the tear, just to give some motivation more. And, but I, I think that we cannot use to, uh, to change our indication or, or our therapy. Susan? Uh, yes, we I have... have a question about uh, a patient expectation. Um, with more and more research demonstrating that patient expectation are very strong predictors of response to treatment, what can we do as therapists, surgeon, colleagues to uh, harness the expectation for the patient? So maybe I would like to start by answering and then I will be very happy to give the word to Joe. I think that for for many many years it was it was uh, incorporated in our profession already to be positive and create realistic but positive expectations and to behave like a coach to our patients. But I think we should be more uh, explicit in this. We we should know that creating positive expectations will also lead to positive outcome. And this is something that was not proven before that it really determines the outcome of your treatment. But Joe, I will be very happy to uh, hand over the word to you.
Well, I completely, I completely agree with what you've just said. I guess this is a perfect opportunity, though, to say probably one of the most important things is we're all saying the same thing. So surgeons and physiotherapists, is, which is why an evening like this is so fantastic, because I think incongruent information about expectations, um, if we're not giving a coherent message and using similar language, then we can each set each other up to fail. Um, so I absolutely concur with Anne's message, but I also think that we kind of need to take more seriously how we come up with a, a common thread and a common language that, if you like, empowers patients on that journey. And so we all set the same expectations. Uh, Susan, maybe the time is over now and uh, um, we... Uh... I just have just one quick last one. <laughs> yeah, you don't uh, mind. We, we, we that's have a one request. <laughs> that's a request. <laughs> yes, <laughs> from the top uh, authorities. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, one about the indirect arthroscopic uh, MRI. What's the use of it? Do we use it? Is oh. it useful? Shema? Um, like arthrography, indirect Art arthrography, I guess. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, arthrography. Uh, yeah, it was a. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, Atra, I can't use... Atra MRI or something. Yeah, yeah. No. yeah. Well, I use the direct yeah. one. I mm -hmm. don't use the indirect one unless there is, you know, some tumor or other things. But that's that's something that's a different different indication. But no, I don't use it. Okay. Uh, we would like to thank all the uh, and it's, I think this is it was a, a very good discussion and uh, I would like to. Thank all the speakers and uh, uh, Susan. Uh, do you want to say something? Thank you to you. Thank you to all of the speakers and all the audience. Also, we know that, that we have many, many uh, people online, so yeah. we are very happy about that. Now uh, the podium is yours, uh, Alexandra. Uh, Alexandra, your voice is mood. Oh, sorry, I'm back again. That was a little mistake, yes. All right, perfect. Thank you, Mehmet and uh, Suzanne. So the question is, of course, if non-operative treatment fails and the pain remains, which kind of surgical procedure will we perform? And this topic will be covered by uh, Philippe Collin. Dr. Collin is a shoulder surgeon working in saint Grégoire and in Paris, and he's the general secretary of the SESIC and he will discuss uh, which surgical procedure he performs in case of shoulder pain and repairable rotator cuff. Which surgical procedure do I perform and is a repair always necessary? So what is our subject? Our subject is repairable rotator cuff tear but what is a repairable rotator cuff tear? When it is irreparable? It is irreparable when you have fat infiltration. As you can see here, when you have fat infiltration more than grade two, means grade three or four, then you can say that it is not repairable. Of course, when you have no cartilage, it's not possible to repair, as you can see here. On the Amada and Fukuda classification, stage one and two, you can repair, but stage three, four, and five, you cannot repair because you have a superior static migration of the head and it is irreversible, and then you cannot repair. Sometimes it's more rare, but when you have a supra subscap tear, you can observe a, a, an anterior subluxation of the head. And then when you have that, it's not possible to repair. So now we need to define as well the term of massive rotator cuff tear and the term of large rotator cuff tear. So what is a massive tear? What is a large tear? In fact, if you look at the literature, the term of large rotative cuff tear has been defined by Bob Cofield in 1992 in the Journal of Gynecology. And the definition is not very good because it seems that it's only regarding the, the centimeter of the tear. Three to five centimeter or more than five centimeter, it's massive or large. But so it means that you need to trust your eyes only. But look at those two tables. 
you definitely think that they're not the same. If you look at it, you think, no, they are not the same. But look, if you look at this and this, this and this, same. This and this, this and this, same. So those two tables are exactly the same. So we should not trust our eyes. We should have more, a, a better definition in order to speak about mar large tear or massive tear. That's why I definitely like the definition of Christian Gerber. We should not speak about large tear. We should always speak about massive tear. And a massive tear is when you have at least two tendons involved. That's very easy to, to, to remember. So now, when it is repairable, when it is an isolated tear or a massive tear, how I do it? So personally, I think that in 2020 now, it's always under arthroscopy. It's, you can do it with uh, local anesthesia or general anesthesia. Personally, I always do it under local anesthesia only. And I think that daycare surgery is possible. Personally, I always do it in daycare surgery. So how to do it? The main debate is single row versus double row. And I will show you later a video. So what is a single row? What is a double row? I think that it's better to perform a double row as it has been published in this meta-analysis. You can see that the, the results on the meta-analysis were better when you have two rows of anchors compared to one row of anchor. So that's why double row is probably better. So what is our technique? We've published it with Alex Lederman many years ago as a technical note, and we're going to look at it. So here, we are in the operating room, and here. And then you can see that the patient is in the beach chair position here. You can see the impingement between the rotator cuff tear and the acromion. Here, we have prepared the acromion. And we perform what we call an acromioplasty in order to have a better, more space between the acromion and the rotator cuff. Here, we see very well the tear. We can remove some bursitis, as you can see here. It's easier to see. And you can see here the tear. We prepare here. We try to find the best position for our anchors here. So I like to put an anchor very close to the cartilage for the major row here. And we are going to see that we are going to perform two rows. That's why we call that a double row. So one row, one anchor is close to the cartilage. And the other anchor, the other anchor, sorry, is more lateral here. After we take a device, and we are going to put some thread into the tendon here, and we check if it's going to be good or not. Here it's good. And we are going to start, we are going to start by the repair on the major row here with a sliding knot. You can see that we perform the knot outside of the patient, and it's a sliding knot. So we have two knots very on the medial part and two knots on the lateral part. So that's why we call that the double row. It means that if we have a failure on the major row, you still have the second row or the opposite. As you can see here, at the end of the procedure, the tendon is very well positioned on the greater tuberosity. So what are our results? Uh, we've published our result with a short-term follow-up at six months with more than 400 patients. And we were very surprised to see that six months after surgery, one patient out of five means 20% of the patient were unhappy. So you need to wait. At six months after surgery, if the patient is not doing very well, it's not very serious, don't worry. You should wait, wait, wait. Sometimes you need more, in, we need an injection. 
Sometimes you need more rehabilitation, but just need to wait because we've published that at nine months, it was quite better. So don't worry, one patient out of five is not healed at six months. So not what are the long-term follow-up? We've published our results with more than 1,000 rotator cuff repair. You can see here the flow chart of the, of the patients. And we've published it in the GSES uh, um, Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery A. Uh, and at 10 years follow-up, isolated suprater result was good. We still have 80% of healing healed tendon at 10 years follow-up. And it was even 19% when it was only patient with fat infiltration grade zero. So it means that if you operate, you have very, very, very good result when you operate not too late, but with the patient without fat infiltration. Same result at 20 years, a bit less good, but almost the same on isolated suprater. Then we looked at the massive suprater, massive rotator cuff tear. And for the massive rotator cuff tear, as you can see here, the result at 10 years were good. A bit less good compared to isolated suppressors, that's logical, but still good, and the same at 20 years. So is a repair always necessary? I think no. It's not always necessary to repair rotator cuff tear. I suggest my decision tree, it is only my position, it is not the science, it is what I think, what I do daily in, the, in my daily practice. For me, the most important is pain, because when you have a shoulder pain, it's awful, really awful. It's like a teeth, it's very, very painful. So if there is no pain, I never operate. If there is a pain, and the patient is less than 25 years old, I always operate. If there is a pain and the patient is more than 65 years old, then I try injection on rehabilitation. And if it's a failure, I operate. So is a repair always necessary? Of course, uh, after this decision tree, if I've decided to operate, then I will repair the tendon. I do not perform isolated long bicep stenotomy if I can repair. Thank you so much. And thank you for everything because I always like to share this with my good friend Physio. Thank you. Great, thank you, Philip. So our next discussion, of course, is the post-operative treatment after rotative of tears, and it's still a controversial uh, topic. An important question here is: whatever we need to do, do we need to use a sling or not? And the next speaker is Dr. Alexander Lederman. He's working in Geneva, Switzerland, and he's the chairman of the member committee of the SESEC. He's already done a lot of research on the subject, and I have read, I have read with great interest his uh, randomized study on wearing or not wearing bandage after rotator cuff repair. Therefore, I'm looking to hearing his presentation on this topic. Dear Alexander, the floor is yours. but it seems the presentation is not coming. I will still wait for uh, 30 seconds. So based on which parameters during the surgery I decide to mobilize immediately or not my patient. Most surgeons prescribe nowadays a period of shoulder immobilization in an abduction pillow with the arm in neutral rotation or slight internal rotation. And the patients are advised to uh, wear the slings or the brace if, uh, in the first four to six weeks. However, the rehabilitation protocols are mainly based on surgeon opinion and experience rather, th rather than scientific rationale. And the few surgeons that analyze rotator cuff healing study it uh, on rats, sheep, and primates. 
and we are completely different. First of all, the human has an erect posture with a weight-bearing joint that became a non-weight-bearing joint. And another particularity is that the superior cuff is on the maximal tension at rest, and this is something that is very unique. So we are able nowadays to analyze precisely what's happened in the joint, um, the supercommon space, the uh, contact um, of the cartilage, contact on the labrum, but also the muscle lengthening. And interestingly, there is, if you move the subscapularis, a lengthening important up to 170%, and it's even worse for the teres minor, 132%. So it's not safe to stimulate this muscle postoperatively because such lengthening could destroy your repair. And this is not the case for supraspinatus because there is always a shortening of the supraspinatus. Immobilization can be quite well tolerated, like in this patient, you see that he, if it's comfortable, he's okay. But this is uh, not always the case. First of all, with immobilization, it has a cost. Uh, and this um, sling after a while are destroyed. Uh, there, there are some wear, obvious wear, and this uh, splint has to be from time to time replaced. So this is the first problem. The second problem that we observe is bad positioning. So I swear that I saw absolutely everything in my practice. This is probably not the, the best example for this patient, but this the next one is a true patient. This is what I see regularly in my practice. So the patient don't manage very well postoperatively the sling if they wear it first. The one more problem is a uh, uh, problem of falls that are quite frequent. And interestingly, this is more frequent after uh, rotator cuff repair than a total hip uh, replacement or a total, total knee replacement. And finally, this leads to uh, patient frustration. Uh, the patient cannot drive, they have functional limitation, delayed recovery, and also problem to return to work. So uh, frustration is a very important factor. So the side effect of immobilization are muscle atrophy, joint stiffness, and pain. And if you could move your patient early after the surgery, you may observe a decrease of pain, a decrease in stiffness, and also it may facilitate uh, return to activities. So we did a study that we published last year in the GBGS. We took 80 patients and this patient has been divided into groups. They all had isolated full thickness superior tear. It was small to medium tear and 40 of the patient had a sling and 40 patients did not receive postoperatively a sling. Um, they all had exactly the same protocol of rehabilitation. During the hospital day, the physiotherapist explained to the patient that they could not do active abduction and active elevation, elbow at the side, they could do whatever uh, they wanted. Otherwise, the protocol was exactly the same for the two groups. And <clears throat> after uh, four weeks, the patient were allowed to progressively return to activity. At six months, they all had an echography and they, we did not observe any significant difference in tendon thickness, bursitis, echogenicity, or repair integrity. But with the no sling group, the patient didn't have more pain, but they have an improved functionality and a greater early range of motion at every single follow-up, at six weeks, three months, six months. So something that were really interesting. So if you have a good repair, a good bone, good tendon quality, and you repair a super curve, it's relatively safe to mobilize the patient immediately after the surgery because there is, all, all, there is always shortening versus lengthening if it's an anterior or a posterior curve. Uh, the second point is the rotator cable is intact. And the third point, and I think this is very important, we operate general, generally very clever patient that can learn quicker than rats, sheep, and primates. 
So in conclusion, in my practice, this is the post-operative rehabilitation is a la carte. I propose uh, an immobilization in internal rotation for the entire cuff for a period of four to six weeks, depending on the quality of the tendon and of the repair. I propose nothing if I have a superior rotator cuff repair. And if it's a posterior, I propose a, uh, an immobilization in abduction external rotation for uh, four to six weeks, knowing that the abduction race has a very low adherence um, by the patient. Thank you very much for your attention. If you are interested in good science, I welcome you to the next Valdezer shoulder course. Uh, this will be in April next year. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation and again, your great acting skills. As the next speaker of the session, I would like to introduce Mrs. Rina Twiddle. Twiddle is a, Mrs. Twiddle is a physiotherapist in Leeds in the United Kingdom, and she's also chairman of the scientific committee of USER. I am pleased that she accepted, accepted our invitation to speak about post-operative physiotherapy for repaired rotating of tears. Hi, my name is Rina. I am a physiotherapist and today I'm going to be talking about rehabilitation following rotator cuff repair. And my aim is to give you some practical um, points that you can put into clinical practice based upon the available um, evidence base. So when I was putting my slides together, I came across a paper from Kane et al. in America this year, and they found that there was still a significant discrepancy of opinion between physios and surgeons as to how to manage our post-operative rotator cuff um, repair patients. Physios preferring shorter immobilization and earlier strengthening, and surgeons being a little bit more conservative about weight bearing and time-based um, transitions. However, in the United Kingdom, Professor Chris Littlewood and his team are hoping to embark on the RACER2 trial, looking at the clinical and cost effectiveness of early patient directed rehab versus standard rehabilitation following a cuff repair. And I think this is going to have a massive impact on physiotherapy practice. So at the moment, what do we consider? We want to consider the tissue quality, the tear type and the size. And by tissue quality, we mean atrophy and fatty atrophy, because this will have an impact on the surgical intervention. We want to consider the patient's comorbidities, including diabetes and smoking and the effect that this may have on their healing tissue and also their pre-op level of function and beliefs. Often patients have had shoulder pain for a significant period of time before rotator cuff repair, and they might have that expectation that they're gonna get the shoulder back that they had five or six years ago. And I think discussing expectations, beliefs, and their pre-op level of function will really help drive rehabilitation forwards. So early versus delayed mobilization. At the moment in the literature, it's a little bit like comparing apples and pears. But hopefully what we can conclude from the body of evidence is that there's similar long term results. Functions better in the short term with early mobilization and there's no statistical difference in adverse effects such as retail rate. And the point I want to draw upon a little bit more here is the similar long term results, because I think if you've had delayed mobilization, at what cost has that been to you at the beginning in terms of your activities of daily living, needing to get other people for help and support, and also not being able to work and the financial impact that that's had. So what exercises can we consider as soon as possible? So contralateral um, strengthening, so unilateral strengthening, getting that increased neural drive from the motor cortex, also, Smith et al. looked at ipsilateral kinetic chain exercises in the sling, which were quite safe for supraspinatus activity, but you might want to be a little bit more cautious if there's been a subscapularis repair. Also, the correlation between grip strength and rotator cuff strength. And therefore, whilst the rotator cuff is relatively inactive, it might be a good idea to keep grip strength going. The cardiovascular system, to keep that ticking on. And also considering the consequences of having a painful rotator cuff for a long period of time and how that might impact your exercises. So there'll be central motor alterations, there'll be proprioceptive deficits and muscle adaptations as described by Ellenbacher and Cools with that reduced posterior tilt and upward rotation of the scapula. 
So choosing exercises, what does the rotator cuff do? Well, we know it's a rotator. So in external rotation, the posterior cuff is active, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and in internal rotation, the anterior cuff, subscapularis is active but it also works in a direction specific manner through flexion and extension as shown by the um, work by Watson and Pocornkel in 2011. So through flexion, the posterior cuff is active and in extension, the anterior cuff is active. And also the axioscapular muscles are very active. And I've taken this next graph directly from Watson and Pocornkel's um, paper because it really nicely illustrates those axioscapular muscle activity through flexion and extension. And I think the other thing to draw upon here is at relatively low loads, so about 20% flexion and extension, you can see that the cuff is, um, the, the cuff has an um, average EMG maximal voluntary contraction of around 20% apart from infraspinatus, which is a little bit higher. So we can take this forwards into our um, rehabilitation and it will have an impact on the choice of exercises that we might choose to use when considering load. So other early exercises. So EMG studies have been looked at um, in the rotator cuff. And there's been a nice systematic review by Edwards et al. that looks at supraspinatus activity and exercises that keep maximal voluntary contraction to around 15%. So we've got the walk back here, which is also really good for early auxiliary hygiene. We've got a table slide and a wall slide, and then sideline flexion and um, also some scapular prone retraction there. And then more of a weight bearing position here. So this is a closed kinetic chain exercise for flexion and prone retraction of the scapula um, that hopefully tries to get the proprioceptive system um, active as well. So other exercises that we might want to consider include the kinetic chain. So Richardson et al. this year looked at the kinetic chain and um, exercise and found that actually incorporating the kinetic chain reduces the demand on the rotator cuff. So perfect for us as physios to be using early on. So here I've got Tom doing some weight transfer through flexion. I've got him doing the Kibler exercise where there's weight transfer through his legs, but also through his spine. And then the step back robbery exercise, again, another one of Kibler's exercises. If I wanted to isolate the rotator cuff a little bit further earlier on in um, rehabilitation, I might think about supporting Tom's arm here in a scaption plane and starting to get his um, cuff working through internal and external rotation. You can see that I've given him some TheraBand here just to give him a little bit of proprioceptive feedback. So what I was finding is that his elbow, wrist and hand was starting to drift. I think the other thing about taking the kinetic chain away is that we know ourselves, if we were to do an exercise such as a shoulder press in the gym, it's much harder if you're sitting than if you're standing and you haven't got that drive from your lower limbs and your kinetic chain. So in the next exercise, I've taken away the support from his um, arm, but also given him some proprioceptive feedback under his armpit with a towel there and kept the TheraBand. So if I wanted to make rotation a lot harder, might get him to think about moving his legs as well as loading up his shoulder. And then I might take away the kinetic chain, but still support the arm, but add some load. And then to make it super difficult here, I've got gravity working against him in this prone position. I've got load in his hand and you can see that his scapula is really having to work hard and those muscles, his axioscapular muscles are really having to um, activate to keep his scapula on his thorax in this position. So through flexion and extension, what an upper call gives us the um, ideas of a bench press for flexion and an extension for row, so through flexion, the posterior cuff being active, and an extension, the anterior cuff being active. And I've given Tom some load here, but you can take that away um, if you wanted to be a little bit, um, if you wanted to load him up a little bit less in the earlier stages. So Joseph et al. describes the scapular I's, Y's and T's as a really good way of getting rotator cuff activation as well as lower trapezius activation. And you can see here that these exercises are nice because they combine flexion extension with rotation, which I think is um, really important for function. So in conclusion, 
post-operative protocols are really difficult to construct because of lots of individual factors, not just the patient's tendon tear type and their comorbidities, but also um, considerations around beliefs and expectations. I think we should look to achieve milestones in pain and function before progression and not to focus too much on weeks and times. And you can see that I've purposefully left off um, timescales on these exercises. And then lastly, physios are really good at this. Take things back if required. Think about gravity. Think about function. Think about other ways that you can get the kind of movement that you want out of this patient's limb. And then finally, I thought I'd leave you with this clip on how to not um, rehab someone's cuff following um, rotator cuff repair. Thank you for listening. Great. Thank you, Rina. As last speaker, I would like to introduce Jasmine Kardel. Mrs. Kardel works as a physiotherapist in Breda, the Netherlands, and is the current president of USO. And she will give her view how we can send our patients back to work as soon as possible. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to give you this short presentation about sending your patient back to work. I am Jasmin Karel, president of USER, a researcher in public health and work-related musculoskeletal complaints, and a teacher in physiotherapy at an applied university in the Netherlands. I will not only talk about your patient uh, that is already absent, but also um, talk about patients with rotator cuff-related pain uh, that are at risk of absenteeism, because this usually amounts to the largest group of patients that you see in physical practice. So as we all know, the main cause uh, we can contribute to shoulder pain is what we call subacromial pain syndrome or rotator cuff disease. Conservative treatment has been shown to be a very effective treatment for these patients and usually is considered before doing operative treatment. The most common treatment for these patients is in the form of exercise therapy. Um, but I always have a big but with this uh, because we can try and train as hard as we can with this patient population. But if other negative influencing factors will not be addressed, treatment will not be successful or at least less successful. So one common cause or a mediating factor in, these pa in, in your patient's recovery uh, can be their occupation. Certain work can be considered a risk factor for activities um, or activities at work can influence the recovery of uh, the complaints of the patients. And we call these uh, work-related musculoskeletal complaints. But what are exactly work-related musculoskeletal complaints? According to the CDC, work-related musculoskeletal disorders are conditions in which the work environment and performance of work contribute significantly to the condition or and the condition is made worse or is persists longer because of their work condition. So we all know that musculoskeletal disorders are the most common work-related problems in Europe and almost 24% of the EU workforce reports suffering from either backache pain or 22% complain about muscular pains. Now, any worker can be affected, yet musculoskeletal diseases can be prevented by assessing work tasks, putting in place preventive measures, and checking that these measures stay effective. Even one study found that 39% of 108 patients in total who were questioned in their GP's waiting room thought that their illness was possibly caused by work, and two-thirds also said that they thought that their illness was possibly worsened by their work. I don't have a lot of time in this presentation, but I will uh, give a quick overview of some risk factors. And we, uh, we know that there's a lot of evidence that exposure to combinations of physical workplace strains, such as overhead working, heavy lifting, forceful work, uh, or in awkward positions, increase the risk of shoulder disorders. And there are several other physical, organizational, or individual factors. So occupational healthcare is a very specific area in the Netherlands, and we've noticed a big gap between the primary healthcare system and the occupational healthcare system. A lot of patients actually um, don't work for a big company that have occupational healthcare available, so they come to the primary healthcare um, system. 
And from several qualitative studies, we know that primary healthcare physiotherapists and general practitioners do not recognize the work relatedness of musculoskeletal diseases. And this may lead to some serious health problems or unnecessary absenteeism from work. So a careful occupational history that we can do as a physical therapist should include the name and the nature of the occupation, obviously, and should inquire about the exposures involving the shoulder, including working overhead, lifting weights, the use of force or repetitive movements, pulling or pushing, um, or any other relationship that can be between the current symptoms and other possible exposures. It can be useful to inquire if symptoms are better or worse when the patient takes time away from work, and there are some validated questionnaires you could use. Another simple way is to just ask the patient to keep a small activity log or like a diary at work and to see how the patient, how disabled the patient feels doing each activity. Well, the greatest precision which I always use is to just um, make a video recording of the patient while they carry out some of their usual activities at work. And then you can do a detailed ergonomic analysis of that. And the best way to do this is for the patient to ask a coworker to secretly film them uh, at some point during the day. Otherwise, the patient might adapt their motor behavior. So besides the fact that we have certain specific treatment goals that focus on treating the illness or disease process, like strengthening the upper extremity, we will also have to question the patient about their work-related activities. And we will have a closer look at some important factors that you could consider as a physical therapist. So when you're doing, for example, an analysis of a video, you can um, consider some key elements in biomechanics, for exa example, like a joint position, body posture, and the amount of leverage that is necessary to do the activity. If there is a contact muscle tension, constant muscle tension, it can lead to uh, muscle or joint strains. I once had a shoulder pain patient that was working for a big agricultural company and she would have to cut big leaves with her right hand and then immediately place the leaves over her left arm, like cupping her arm like this and then holding her on the elbow. And so the left arm continually had to hold these leaves and then by just simply adjusting this work activity by using a cart to collect the leaves, she already had less pain in her arm. And the most important thing, in my opinion, uh, for a physiotherapy is that you have to communicate. You have to talk with your patient. Some important communication topics would be, firstly, their motivation at work, if they're still working. And if they're not working, you would have to assess their motivation for returning to work. The success of addressing the workplace environment in your therapy might be dependent on their motivation. Likewise, the expectancy that they have about the treatment influences the treatment result. And whether psychosocial factors are affecting the patient is another important thing, thing you can discuss with your patient. Emotions like fear or the demands at the workplace or activities, they should be discussed. Maybe you cannot do a lot about it, but discussing it can already be helpful to for the patient to recognize them. And because primary care physiotherapists usually cannot do work visits, you are very dependent on the willingness of the patient to address certain things at work themselves. And if they don't experience the support from coworkers or their supervisor, it might be very difficult to achieve changes at the workplace. We all know sitting is the new smoking, but sitting is not a bad thing. And the most important thing you have to communicate to your patient is that a variety in postures is very important. The same accounts for a standing posture. You cannot stand all day because that's also physically exhausting. It's better to just vary in positions. So what we can conclude is that work-related diseases are a substantial part of the diseases presented in primary care. Accordingly, physiotherapists should be aware of this issue because in many patients, work can affect a disease and vice versa, diseases can influence their workability. On the one hand, it's very important that we still focus on increasing the physical capacity of our patient, but we should also consider possibly advising some ergonomic adjustments to reduce physical strains and exposure of the patient. 
thank you all for listening and I'd love to hear your questions during the moderation session. Alexander, we don't hear you. All right, I will unmute it again. Thank you, Jasmine. So for this last Q&A session, I would like to introduce Ingrid Gultenheim and Charpa Alta. Mrs. Gultenheim is a physiotherapist in Gothenburg, Sweden, and the vice president of USER. And Dr. Alta is working as a shoulder surgeon in Haarlem, the Netherlands. And he's the chairman of the healthcare delivery committee of the SESIC. And they will both moderate this Q&A session. Thank you and good evening everyone. So we have a lot of, of interesting questions and uh, I would like to put together three of the questions uh, that are, are in the upper range here and it is regarding prehab, pre-operative rehabilitation. So do you prescribe, prescribe it and also what are the reasons? Uh, is it to, to decrease uh, stiffness or do you have other reasons for why you are uh, prescrib prescribing uh, prehab? And we could ask both uh, Alexandra and Philippe Collin. I would so, like to have your both answers. Okay, cool. I'm going to begin. Um, it clearly depends on the situation. Uh, as Philippe has said, there are patients that are that have that are young, they have an acute trauma, and some of these patients you have to go to OR because if you wait too much, you won't be able to repair the cuff anymore. So for this type of patient, there is absolutely no need for surgery uh, for, for physiotherapy. We do we, we do the surgery and they will have then a nice rehabilitation. Otherwise, physiotherapy is the key. We described with Philippe Collin in 2015 and uh, with Florence and Guyenne, a uh, very nice surgery that proved that physiotherapy could restore range of motion and even um, help patients to get rid of uh, pseudoparalytic shoulder um, and this in the long term. So physiotherapy is the key because in most of the patients would simply avoid a surgery. So to regain range of motion, to rehabilitate your patient, if the patient is above 60, I think that there is no need for acute surgery. The patient has to prove that physiotherapy failed before, um, before going to OR. So it really depends on the situation, but in most of my patient has preoperatively physiotherapy. So mm -hmm. Philippe Collin, would you like to, to add anything to that? No, it's okay. It's just for me, uh, always physio if the patient is stiff before surgery. I never operate on a stiff shoulder. So if the patient is stiff, there is no discussion. So uh, physio first. And sometimes I like physio before because you can have an appointment between the physio and the patient and, and they, can, they, can get along, they can see if they get along well, if everything is okay. So that, it's, a, it's not very scientific, but I like that. Ingrid, can I, can I be a bit of the advocate of the devil? Uh, because uh, presumably it depends on which country you uh, got operated on for your rotator cuff. Uh, if you go to uh, Alexander, you uh, not get immobilized afterwards. But in a lot of countries, you still get immobilization uh, after a rotator cuff uh, repair. Uh, and all these exercises before the operation, are they not uh, completely gone? The muscles are gone after four to six weeks of uh, immobilization. What is the ideas of the, uh, maybe we can ask uh, Yasmin and uh, uh, Rina for, uh, for their opinion. Well, obviously uh, you're from the Netherlands, right, Charco? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe Rina, you would like to answer first? I started talking and I was on mute, so sorry. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to think that in the UK, we probably don't immobilise for six weeks. And even in that immobilised period of time or being in the sling, the patient is doing exercises. Um, so the sling's there for comfort, but there's still a lot of time when they're out of their sling and moving their arm. 
Um, so I don't think that you have undone any of the work that, you know, that you put in before um, preoperatively or with pre-rehab. So I think if we're talking about slings, then it's very similar to the Netherlands. It's, it's for comfort and uh, you definitely prescribe some exercises that they do without slings. Um, and um, pre-operative, well, I do think that the main uh, um, strategy in the Netherlands, and Charco, I'm going to confirm with you, is that you, we usually do conservative therapy before, so that's basically already sort of pre-operative treatment based yeah. on exercises. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And we spoke about it a lot earlier um, about beliefs and expectations in that pre-rehab phase. It's a really good time for the physio and the patient to discuss these things and um, move rehab forwards. Yeah, and, and may I add another question also? Uh, now in the corona time, do you all have access to surgery or do you have a delay in surgery? Can uh, so. Do you know that if you have your patient, can you operate in the next upcoming week? Or so what is your delays and what should the patient do until you have the, the access to surgery? It's a, it's a very good question. So during the first wave, I had to stop during six weeks, uh, but we had to operate emergencies. And if you could prove that your patient has a rotator cuff that should not wait one month, six, uh, one month, six weeks, you, you had the right to operate on this patient. Actually, it's a little bit different because uh, there is no real lockdown and nothing has completely stopped. So we can still operate this kind of uh, uh, urgent patient, at least in Switzerland. In Belgium, we currently, we need to wait. Uh, Everything that couldn't, can't wait for six weeks, we need to wait to operate. So because most of the, the curve tears are degenerative, these are put on the waiting list. This is, this is a very good question because I think patients are very anxious about that. So I think that uh, if it's not a traumatic tear, we can wait for an isolated supra tear or even two tendon. Not for the subscap. Subscap is another, is another subject, but if the patient has an isolated suprater, chronic tear, I think that to, you can wait three or four months. It's not a problem for me, not at all. Exercising I agree. during this time could also uh, maintaining the motor patterning within the motor cortex, that it could also be an ideal for doing the exercises. And as we uh, Rina said, I think in the majority of, of countries, even if you are wearing a sling, you are doing exercises three or even six times per day, removing the sling and so on. So we call that to be immobilized, but the patient rarely is completely immobilized. Okay. Would you agree? I'd, say, I'd agree with that, but I'd also say in these COVID times that probably access to your therapists might not be that great. <laughs> Um, with, you know, working in different areas and being redeployed in different areas. So it's maybe not an ideal time for the patient full stop, um, even with prehab and the cuff tears that can wait. Okay, so we go over to, to surgery qu questions. Yeah. Is there an anatomical reason for an acromioplasty or is it only to have more surgical space? Mm, that's a very good question. Uh, there is no answer in the literature, not at all. Uh, first of all, it is true that there is probably less impingement than what we think. I agree. I agree that the, the, the tear, which is related to an impingement, is not so frequent. But you have some. It's not zero. So, first. Second, I think that, it's of course, it's easier to operate when you perform an acroplasty. You have more space, for me at least. And first, uh, you know that when you perform an acromioplasty at the end, you will have some blood from the bone to the tendon. There is no scientific data on that, but why not? It could be some healing factor in the, in the, in the, in the blood. So that's why I think it's had never been published that it was not useful to do an acromioplasty, never. So why not? It's better for the surgeon, probably better for the, for the healing, and so there is no risk to do it. 
Philippe, can I ask you a technical question based on that topic? When do you decide, uh, uh, do you always, first question is, do you always do then an acromioplasty if you repair the cuff? And the second question is, when during the procedure will you do that? Do you first start with an acromioplasty or do you first start or first repair the cuff and then afterwards do the acromioplasty? Uh, I always do it, 100%. And I always do it at the beginning, like I showed in, like I showed it in the video, always. I'm not bothered by the blood, by the bleeding, never. Okay, and uh, Alexandre, can you answer that same question as well? Yeah, um, um, I just published a, a comparative study and uh, actually we plan for acromoplasty, meaning that all the patients before the surgery has uh, capture motion, had a uh, CT scan with uh, reconstruction, and we have been able to see preoperatively where are the zone of contact of possible impingement. And so the, 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 we, we divided the patient into two groups. One group had a planned acromoplasty and a group has um, an unplanned acromoplasty knowing that I didn't know preoperatively the critical shoulder angle, the potential zone of contact and so on. And so we, we haven't seen huge difference uh, at six months. The healing rate was the same. The uh, range of motion was almost the same, um, uh, except in internal rotation hand in the back where the patient that had guided acromoplasty had better internal rotation hand in the back. The interesting thing is uh, if you do a plan acromoplasty, you will remove 50% of the uh, of the impingement postoperatively. This is what we showed. And the second interesting thing was that the, the impingement was never like where we think, meaning the, uh, at the anterolateral part of the acromion. It can be unilateral, it can be posterior. So depending of the patient and depending of its activity, the, the, the impingement is at different places. So now I try to not to do random acromoplasty, but rather guided acromoplasty. And my acromoplasty are clearly uh, more lateral than they were before, uh, because at the beginning I was only doing anterior acromoplasty. So and I then, changed my practice. And then from a technical point of view, do you do it first and then repair the cuff, or do you do it afterwards uh, after you repair the cuff? So, uh, I'm not as uh, as skilled as Philippe because from time to time I have bleeding. So if the the acromion does not disturb me to do the repair, I prefer to do the repair first and then the acromoplasty, except if I don't have an, a good view, of course. Yeah, I I would be interested if if I am permitted because I'm getting a WhatsApp that uh, we only have the last question to to ask now, but. Uh, uh, from uh, how do the arena and uh, and Jasmine, how do you think about acromioplasties in general? If you hear all these surgeons talking about acromioplasties, maybe arena first and then uh, Jasmine. In the context of having a rotator cuff repair. Yes, please. Uh, Jeff, I I can't say that I. Um, I mean, when we read the op note, but I can't say that there's too much of a consideration of if there's been an acromioplasty or not. I take it, you know, um, what we're trying to do is restore function. And in my mind, you know, if you've said that, you know, they've got good range or, you know, it's a secure repair, that's for us to continue with. So I think that's down to you guys as to what you see when you're inside. Yeah. Okay. Jasmine? Maybe. Well, maybe we could bring up the big placebo study from the British, uh, I forgot in which journal it was published, but it kind of shows that the acromioplasty might not have uh, a big contribution to uh, the patients well, with subacromial pain syndrome, which I classify as patients usually that have rotator cuff diseases um, and maybe some rotator cuff tears in there. Um, so I'm not, I'm, I'm neutral. I'm Switzerland, I guess. 
But we are not neutral us. Um, <laughs> we publish we publish an answer of this article. You can see it on PubMed. Yeah, the, uh, I agree with Philippe. This is not the best article ever. It's not, it's, it's not really, really not bias. a good article. <laughs> there, 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 there is a lot of bias, and um, <laughs> when 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 we do meta analysis now, we, we even exclude this kind of study because there are too many bias. So, Sorry, <laughs> the problem. That's good to know. Um, you Rina, can see it. Rina, uh, have you ever seen Rina? Ontario Superior Escape after a road stock of repair. Have you ever that, seen uh, an Ontario Superior Escape after a road stock of repair? Nope. No. So I think that Philippe is right. Uh, Acromplasty is a rather safe procedure, I think. Okay, I think it's perfect ending, a little bit controversy at the end. <laughs> you, we need another, <laughs> another webinar. We need another webinar. Because yeah, there's <laughs> the beginning. Well, it's a good start there. No, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, before I will discuss, I would say the most important uh, keep home messages. I will repeat again that the physiotherapists and the doctors can request an accreditation uh, for this webinar at the end of this webinar. So after my presentation, there will be a short questionnaire that will be opened. And at the end of this questionnaire, you will be able to enter your uh, code. And we need these codes to complete your accreditation. And we also kindly ask for the people that don't need the accreditation to fill in this feedback. And at the conclusion of this webinar, I would like to uh, give a little bit the following uh, points. So first of all, if we know the anatomy, it's important to look to the location of the tear because it really determines uh, the symptoms. In the clinical examination, it has been described by Joe Gibson and Leonard Fung that weakness is more important than pain. And certainly look for stiffness because if there is a shoulder stiff, that uh, you don't need to focus too much on the rotator cuff tear, but first on the stiffness. In the technical investigation, please assist in selecting the treatment and identifying also the risk of failure. So it's important to look to the atrophy. We know that the large group of patients that a non-operative tr treatment is the first choice. And as well said by uh, Lars, it's less suitable for surgery or patients with a partial or a small tear with severe pain and also smokers are not uh, the very good patients. The most suitable for surgery are the traumatic tears in young people with good rotator cuff muscles. If you start an operative treatment, start with exercises with low load on the rotator cuff. And in case of surgery and the cuff is repairable, uh, Philippe Collin showed that he always tried to repair the cuff. The biceps is also always treated. Postoperative sling is not necessary for isolated supraspinatus repair. Postoperative rebab, it's important to achieve milestones in pain and function before to progress and don't focus on weeks on our time. The work can certainly affect the disease and vice versa. And it's important to communicate with the patients and give them some advice on, on ergonomics and check psychosocial factors. But I think the most important part of this webinar was that treatment of shoulder pain is Teamwork, and I would like to thank all the uh, speakers, and I also would like to thank the sponsor for uh, the uh, support for this uh, webinar. And of course, I would like to thank all the participants to be so numerous, more than three hundred, and so enthusiastic. And I hope to see you soon on another webinar. Thank you very much.